Fleming, like Malone, was convicted of murder. Like Malone, Fleming's appeal is based on an objection at trial to the sufficiency of the evidence of malice of forethought. Like Malone, Fleming's murder conviction is affirmed. The court had this to say on the subject of malice of forethought. Malice may be established by evidence of conduct which is reckless and wanton and a gross deviation from a reasonable standard of care of such a nature that a jury is warranted in inferring that the defendant was aware of a serious risk of death or serious bodily harm. Malice involves awareness. So, we would expect evidence of the defendant's intoxication to have been relevant insofar as it tends to make it less likely that the defendant was in fact aware of the nature and riskiness of his conduct. If so, extreme intoxication seems to negate conscious awareness. Consider At 0.02 to 0.03 BAC, that's blood alcohol concentration, uh, one feels, um, you know, a little relaxed, a little bit lightheaded, perhaps. The higher the BAC, the more pronounced are the effects of alcohol. Euphoria. Slight impairment of balance at 0.07 to 0.09. Still, euphoria. Judgment and self-control are reduced. And caution, reason and memory are impaired. At 0.08 BAC, it is illegal to operate a motor vehicle in all states. The impairment is equivalent to that of driving while talking on a cell phone. At 0.1 to 0.125, significant impairment of coordination, loss of judgment, speech may be slurred, balance, vision, reaction time, and hearing will be impaired. Still, euphoria. 0.13 to 0.15, gross motor impairment, lack of physical control, Blurred vision, major loss of balance. Euphoria is reduced and dysphoria is beginning to appear. Judgment and perception are severely impaired. 0.16 to 0.19, dysphoria predominates. Nausea may appear. The drinker has the appearance of a sloppy, even unhappy drunk. The impairment at this level of intoxication is equivalent to that of driving while texting. 0.20 blood alcohol concentration. Feeling dazed and confused, disorientated, may need help to stand or walk. On awareness of injury, nausea, vomiting, gag reflex impaired, can choke on vomit. Blackouts likely, no memory. 0.25, all mental, physical, and sensory functions are severely impaired. Increased risk of asphyxiation from choking on vomit and of seriously injuring oneself by falls or other accidents. 0.30, stupor, incomprehension. Tendency to pass out suddenly and to be difficult to awaken. 0.315. This was Fleming's level measured at the hospital. And it goes on to coma and death. If Fleming had pulled over to the side of the road before colliding with the decedent, he probably would have passed out within a matter of minutes. 
The finder of fact might doubt that Fleming was aware of what he was doing, or if he was, of how dangerously he was doing it. Wasn't Fleming's degree of intoxication enough to negate reckless awareness, meaning that there was insufficient evidence of malice of forethought to convict him beyond a reasonable doubt? The Fleming court holds no and cites the model penal code with approval. When recklessness establishes an element of an offense, if the actor, due to self-induced intoxication, is unaware of a risk he would have been aware of had he been sober, such unawareness is immaterial. In other words, Fleming is deemed to have been aware of what he would have been aware of had he been sober. We will return to the topic of intoxication later in the semester. For now, we simply note that the law regards the effects of drinking to be so well known that it is not unfair to deem drinkers to be aware of their possible future lack of awareness. And further, that it is not unfair to deem them to be aware, after getting drunk, of what they are then unaware. This raises another question. If self-induced intoxication cannot negate awareness, can intoxication negate indifference to the value of human life? If so, then intoxication might negate indifference even if it can't negate awareness. An answer to this is given by Judge David Souter, later become Justice Souter of the U.S. Supreme Court. The function of proving extreme indifference is not to establish a state of mind, but a degree of divergence from the norm of acceptable behavior even greater than the gross deviation from the law-abiding norm by which reckless conduct is defined. The court says extreme indifference isn't about the defendant's attitude. It is the circumstances that manifest extreme indifference not the defendant's mental state. Thus, on a scale that measures departures from the standard of reasonable care, extreme indifference represents a deviation that is beyond gross, and gross is already beyond an ordinary deviation from the standard of care. Because the effects of alcohol are generally known, Drinkers are deemed to be aware of what they would be aware of if sober. Note that the effects of texting while driving and phoning while driving are now also generally known. Should texting drivers be deemed to be aware of what they would have been aware of had they not been texting? Should they be convictable of murder? in case they hit someone? Is a texting driver any less a menace than a drinking driver? Statistics suggest the contrary.